his fat bodyguards came out, and Sting called out Foley. I didn't watch last week's show, mind you, but I still largely knew what was going on this week, so that's a credit to TNA. That is a plus. Good job, TNA. Apparently, Foley booked Sting in a match against Samoa Joe last week, and Sting, therefore, wanted Foley booked in a match with somebody this week. Now, the one thing that they fucked up with, well, from watching this, having not watched last week, I understood most of this angle, but it sure would have been nice if they would have fucking told us what happened in the Sting-Samoa Joe match. They made no mention of what happened in that match whatsoever. I have no idea. So I presume nothing much. That is exactly right. So then Steiner tried to, or then Jarrett came out, and uh, and they were trying to, Say, clearly you don't have control of this company since Foley is now booking all this shit and that sort of thing. And Scott Steiner told me it was an easier road to take, which apparently they wanted to join the Mafia. And out came the machine guns. Tanae said he was completely confused. Join the club. It made sense, so. Shelly is still angry about having to wear a turkey costume on Thanksgiving. So he and Saban wanted Foley tonight in a handicap match. And, uh... And Jared said, okay, so there's your main event. This is advertised before the show on the pre- little preview dealy there where it says, tonight, a first blood handicap match featuring Mick Foley and Sting. And I just stared at that sentence for a while thinking, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> a first blood handicap match. Welcome to Vince Russo's world. I also like Alex Shelley's line where he came out and he, he said this, I'm certain, just to get under the skin of Scott Steiner, where he noted, we were backstage playing Resident Evil 5 and Street Fighter 4. Awesome. Great. Yeah. You're not impressed. No. Borash interviewed Foley, who said he was excited to face these two young baby faces. The great white meat baby faces, he called them. But he's going to tweak the match. Then we have... Uh, then we have... So he said, had a long segment with Jarrett, a short segment with Mick Foley, went to commercial, and when he came back, we had Jarrett and Foley. Yes. Foley told Jarrett he was going to tweak the match, and then he left. We never found out what the tweak was. And then Steiner showed up to talk to uh, Jarrett. We had Bashir against Suicide. There were a chance of Fallen Angel. Bashir got the heat. Suicide made a comeback. Everybody got involved. Too many guys, in fact. And Bashir tried to use the belt. He failed. Suicide tried to move. Kiyoshi snuck in the ring. Hit him with a kick. Pinned him. Too much shit going on. So then the bad guys put the X title on Suicide's body. The lights went out when they came back on. Suicide was gone. I sure do hope that when Chris Daniels returns, he can still do magic, and it's not just this costume. No, it's that even better. It's a magical item he has found. I guess we'll see. The mask bears great powers. And this, by the way, went about four minutes. It was fine. It was the only match in the first hour of the show. There's four minutes of wrestling in the first hour. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Lauren interviewed Rhino and Officer Neal. Officer Neal, Rhino said, had a special story he wanted to tell the world. Officer Neal said when he was growing up, he had a buddy named Mark Nieto, and all they wanted to do was become pro wrestlers. So they joined the Navy. (laughs) All right. Anyway, a terrorist attacked at one point, and his buddy was killed. And uh, Rhino was so impressed with Officer Neal's story that he said he was going to personally train him to become a professional wrestler. And they claimed, today actually claimed, that the terrorist attack in question was a suicide bombing of the USS Cole, where over a dozen people died. I presume this was true. I hope this was true. I fuck. I, not I, in the sense that I I, I I am glad twelve people died, but I hope they did not make up this story. No, I, of, well, I, of, I spent a long time trying to decide which would be worse: the fact that they exploited an actual terrorist attack that killed twelve soldiers uh, to get this guy over—that's disgusting. Or the fact that this guy really was in the USS Cole and his friend really did die in this terrorist attack and he personally exploited it then to get his own wrestling career over. I'm not sure which of these is bad. All I know is when this is over, I was pissed off. Really, I wasn't all that offended. I was just, uh, it was just kind of weird. It was very weird. I, I, I mean, I guess it's a real story. It, it, it was certainly a real historical event. It, 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 I, I didn't think, it, it came off like bad acting to me. Which led me to believe it was fake, which pissed me off. I see. But, but, uh, but again, if it's real, he is he's still exploiting his friend's death to get started his wrestling career. That's sick. So there was a lot to hate here. Well, 
Perhaps no, man, I, I, I don't perhaps have a I am with being it. oversensitive. You are being oversensitive because his his fucking buddy, I shouldn't say that, his friend passed away. His pal, they wanted to get in wrestling their whole lives. Uh-huh. So he was he was he was in a sense using his friend to get into wrestling. He's not the first guy to do that before. Well, I mean, if me and my friend, our, our life goal was to get into wrestling, and I died in a suicide attack, I would be fine with my friend using that to actually get into wrestling. I see. Good for you. You did I it. I see. I'd be fine with that. They both wanted to get into wrestling. I didn't have much of a problem with this. I just wasn't sure what the hell was going on here. Clips of the beautiful people cutting the hair of a woman whose face we could not see. Today, somehow determined this was Raisha Saeed. I guess from the her black clothing, apparently. Yeah. Appeared to be a very obvious black wig, by the way. We had a rough cut with 3D plug in the wrestling school. It's and awesome. They talked about leaving WWE and being appalled by the indie geek wrestlers they met when they left. Yeah. So they, they decided uh, to train guys to have respect and to be competent. And they showed some footage from their training school. It looked like a hell of a school. Yeah. They, they have been around a lot. They can teach you stuff. They were talking about passing on their knowledge to young folks like their students and the guys in the front line. The front line. <laughs> Is there still such a thing? I don't know. And they interviewed Sting, who's actually starting to look almost 50, which he wasn't for a long time, but the TNA road alone, yeah. <laughs> the non-road. He actually cut a pretty good promo about how in 1990 he had reconstructive knee surgery, came back five months later, but now he was no spring chicken. If that sort of thing happened again, there would be no comeback. Talked about the night that Foley got his ear ripped off in the match with Vader. He said Foley came back to the locker room with blood all over the side of his head, and the first thing he said was he thought he lost his ear. Bang, bang! <laughs> and I thought, that better be true! I actually, I guarantee you that one's true. It, there could not be a better story. But the point was, this man is nuts, and he's scary in a cage. Lauren was screaming at Abyss, calling him Chris. Talking about how Dr. Stevie had abused him last week in front of the whole world. Threatened to go to the Board of Health. He begged her not to. She said, fine, the next time you go, I will be there with you. Horrible. This is so, so bad. Horrendous. I love Lauren, but stop this bullshit. Foley came out and talked about his next book, Crossing the Line. He cut a... He had a no, his next book, Crossing the Line, by the way, he had taken a notebook... Stretched athletic tape across the front and written "Crossing the Line" in Sharpie. Yeah, which I hope is the real cover. So he started talking about his son Dewey, who is now 17, by the way. Kane Dewey, if you remember, that kid, that kid's now 17. He it, came he, the shit out of you, probably. He, he did mention his son's name was Dewey, and somebody way in the back of the impact zone screamed "Kane Dewey!" and Foley stopped for just a second, and, you, and he was almost laughing, and then pulled together and continued. It was awesome. Anyway, he said that uh, Dewey is now cutting his hair to look like Alex Shelley. And worse, he said the other day he came home and his six-year-old son, Huey. Yes, Huey and Dewey. Those are his names. Those are their real names, everybody. <laughs> Huey and Dewey Foley. That, that you should be calling the Board of Health. That is child abuse. So, anyway, he uh, showed a picture of, of six-year-old Huey, who had this long blonde hair that would set the women's hearts aflutter. And then apparently he cut it off, and he's now got a black mohawk. Like Alex Shelley. Foley was none too happy, and he said he was going to kill these men. This being Alex Shelley and Chris Saban on his children. And he was going to bloody them up and carve them up such that no one would ever want to look like them again. This promo ruled. This was awesome. This was classic Foley of taking something re- re- something that was very cute in real life, which was a card that apparently the machine guns had written for for uh, Dewey that had drawings of them on there, and he just off based off of this one little card, he turned it into something evil and uh, nefarious and violent and scary. Great stuff. And we had an interview with. Um, Booker T. Booker T. I wrote Alex Shelley. The, 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 Michael, I hope Mike, we've got an editor for this report. Mike Tanay said, it's time now for an update on Charmel. And I thought to myself, oh yeah, last time we saw her, at the end of last week's show, Samoa Joe was kidnapping her. They did not, first of all, it, I did not remember that until they, they mentioned this. Second of all, they did not bother to update us on this kidnapping until 54 minutes into the show. That's because this was a classic retarded TNA moment. I mean, this was pure idiocy. Forget the fact that the guy's girlfriend got stolen and they didn't mention it until 54 minutes into the show. What pissed me off is Booker T and Charmel are always getting along. They're a very loving couple. 
They're always, always pushed on TV as two people that really love each other. So on this fucking show, a couple of weeks ago, the Legends title was stolen, and Booker T responded by calling the police and asking for charges to be filed. His fucking woman is abducted by a knife-wielding, angry, fat Samoan, and apparently he just wants a wrestling match. Right. <laughs> Fuck you, TNA. <laughs> That's perfectly reasonable, though. No. Time to settle things, man. The man, Brian, is the only thing that makes sense. Kurt said he was going out with Booker, and the nation of violence would end tonight. So as Joe's heading to the ring for the match, AJ told him that if Angle was going out with Booker, then he was going out with him. And Joe said, as far as he was concerned, the nation of violence was a nation of one. They're trying to make him Steve Austin. Not working. No, in any way. Not working at all. And so he, he said, the nation of one, he kept on walking, AJ watched him walk away and then said, really? Like a, that was a horrible addition, but really? Like an insulted 13 year old is what he sounded like. It was bad. Then we had Booker T versus Joe, and apparently there had been a match last week, and now there was a match this week, and now they're tied up, and so next week there's a tiebreaker, and whichever guy wins, his team gets the advantage. At the uh, at the war games, which of course means the babyfaces are going to win because this is Vince Russo and he's a goddamn idiot. So it was uh, Booker versus Joe, and this match went maybe one minute. Um, it was actually about ninety seconds. Uh, I just know that AJ. Let's see. Angle tried to use a chair. AJ ran down to break it up. Took down Kurt Angle, the Olympic gold medalist, with a double leg. That was a good one. And then Booker tried an axe kick, and Joe just pinned him with a power slam. 90 seconds. Yeah. Over. Yes. Uh, the, because there must be room for more talking. Yes, you have to have more non-action here on Total Non-Stop Action. But, yes, the, Kurt Angle was prepared to hit Samoa Joe with a chair right in front of the referee for God in the world to see, which would disqualify his man and, and cost him this crucial match here for the man advantage. And AJ ran down and stopped him. And Mike Tanae said, AJ just saved Samoa Joe. And I thought, yes, he has saved him from victory. Way to go, AJ! And then Joe won anyway, so it didn't matter, but they're just dumb. Footage of ODB and Cody Diener on a date at Universal Studios, which means they went outside the impact zone, and pure, legit train wreck TV. I <laughs> And then ODB kissed him. Yeah. I, I, I could not... I, I felt ashamed for laughing at this. I think the key was they were playing sweet romantic music as they did their really awful, god-awful comedy throughout this, but... I, I, I can't say it did not make me laugh, so I, I guess that's a thumbs up for TNA. They also ran down the, the lockdown card, which uh, there's a three big matches, which are Lethal Lockdown, uh, Foley and Sting, and the tag match. And they had now put together an undercard, and all it is, every match is three or four or five women or men or teams thrown together just at random. They're the only... In cages. All in a steel cage, yes. So that, that, that is their booking in TNA. Put as many people into the match as possible, because one-on-ones are apparently just boring. Hour and 20 minutes into the show, and six minutes of wrestling, for those who are keeping track. The Guns did a promo, so they were so confident they were going to win, that they were going to put the IWGP Junior titles on the line. In their handicap match against Mick Foley. Mick Foley was going to win the IWGP Junior Tag Team titles. Sure. <laughs> How fucking stupid. <laughs> Exactly. Did the dumbest TNA fan that we saw many weeks ago in those skits actually think Mick Foley was going to win the junior IWGP tag team titles in this match? I Those people, I would put nothing beyond them as far as what they would believe. There's also a, a second rough cut is somewhere in here with Team 3D where they're talking about... They, first of all, they listed what they asked what makes a great team. And they showed great teams of the past, such as the Road Warriors and the Steiners and the Outsiders. That made me laugh. Then Bubba Ray was listening how they've been successful everywhere they went. ECW, WWE, WCW, All Japan, New Japan. Hustle. 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 <laughs> that was awesome. Scott Steiner and James Storm. James Storm basically was the baby face and made a big comeback. And then Nash was out there, and he whacked him with a pipe for the DQ. And the bad guys went to beat him up. But 3D, who had been doing commentary, made the save. And the story here is that Team 3D wants beer money. 
pristine for the tag match, the, the, and vice versa. The tag, yes, the, the the participants in the tag title match respect each other and want them at their best. So that was fine. Uh, I've not seen James Storm as a babyface in years and years and years. He's awesome as a babyface. Of course he is. I've forgotten. So it was short, but it was good for what it was until the really stupid finish, and and then they could move the storyline. So whatever. The only thing I got to say here is is they essentially gave away the finish of of the pay per view by saying. Team 3D actually said if Beer Money wins in Philadelphia, they deserve to be called the greatest tag team of all time. <laughs> Not happening. And nor is it true. Beautiful people in their throne room. Angelina said she was going to win the knockouts title. This led to Awesome Kong. She, she promised to leave, I think it was Kong. She said they were going to leave someone in a pile of blood, hair, and vomit. Yuck. I'm not making that up. Yuck. Awesome Kong against Velvet Sky and Madison Rain. Shockingly. That's the only word I can use. Shockingly, nobody was killed in this match. <laughs> Kong tried to power bomb. Madison tipped them over, so Velvet was on top. And then Kong just turned into a sunset flip for the pin. One minute. <laughs> My favorite part here was, I realized it went one minute, but they still, still somehow, in that minute, managed to get heat on Kong. She started her comeback by taking a missile drop kick. Madison right hit her with a missile drop kick. Kong took this move. Backed up a little bit, and then went on offense, and, and went, that was about it. Then afterwards, Angelina tried to cut off some of Kong's hair, but Taylor Wilde made the save. What? Well, you see, it's... Can we had that in the prior fucking match. Yeah. We don't need every match to be a respect match. It is Taylor... Nobody gives a shit about respect in wrestling. Well, no one gives a we shit about the women's fighting. title match anyway. Doesn't matter. I got an email from somebody that said, I almost never watch TNA, but I still understand who's on whose side with the women. I don't either. Well, it was it's funny. There was a comment made last week by Fo Mick Foley on on this program where he noted nobody wants to see big guys getting along. And I it, it's sort of true. We want to see guys fighting in the show, but we want them to be on opposing factions. And what we have here is a show where all the the all the teammates, all the unions have in in fighting and bickering going on. And everyone who is opposing each other, they are dealing treating each other with, with respect and kindness. Retarded. They have it backwards. Lame. It was not, by the way, until a Jared promo about next week that I realized lockdown is next Sunday. I thought it was this Sunday. That's good. Which I guess makes me happy. <laughs> there was, that's very good news, actually. There's also a commercial here for a new Taco Bell salad where they're listing all their ingredients like cheese and the deep fried taco shell. And then, I, I'm not making this quote up, just enough lettuce. <laughs> they want you, as a Taco Bell consumer, to be aware you will not get too much lettuce buried in your grease and fat. That amused me. Alex Shelley, Saban, and Foley for the IWGP Junior Tag Team Titles. In a first blood match. Sting is an enforcer wearing a purple coat. <laughs> Foley's actually dropped some weight, and he's moving better. That's good. Those are both true. He was, however, wearing black sweatpants, a black T-shirt, white tennis shoes, and a leopard print dress uh, shirt. Sure. My father has never worn anything that bad. <laughs> so, on, on, on Mick Foley, I don't know if I would say that it works, but it got my attention. I know I, I make fun of what my dad wears all the time, but I'm actually, I, I have great respect for him for wearing this kind of thing and not caring at all. I've seen him in, like, long john underwear with, with purple sweatpants over the top that have been cut off into shorts, flip-flops with right socks, I thought it was a, stop right there. and an inside-out T-shirt with the tag sticking out the front. That's tremendous. I cannot top that one, but the, the shorts and over the... And sunglasses and a purse. Excellent. And the first makes it. The shorts over the long pants look. I've never, ever understood that. Why do people do that? It's cold out. They just wear pants. My dad's awesome, everybody. Don't get me wrong. But uh, Foley actually outdressed him here. And so did Larry Sweeney this past week, now that I think about it. These things amaze me now that I now that I try and consider these things. Anyway, got the heat with a drop kick to the cement. A tope setting him into the guardrail. Double in Zagiri. Both men did a tope in a McFoley, by the way. No one died. That was good news. Yeah. And anyway, Saban started mocking Sting, so Sting pulled him outside, gave him the death drop on the floor. Just summarily disposed of this man. Yeah. He presented no... He was defenseless. Foley made a comeback, double arm DPT, put on the, the Socko Claw. The ref saw blood on Foley's sock, apparently from Shelly's mouth, was about to ring the bell when Foley said, No! <laughs> Not yet! Right. You couldn't just win the IWGB Junior Tag Team Battles and then carve him like a Thanksgiving turkey? No. You have to do it during the fucking match? I guess so. So, of course, being a goddamned idiot, 
He got a barbed wire baseball bat, but then Sting clonked him with a chair. One chair shot caused Foley to gig unmercifully, <laughs> and uh, and then they got in a quick brawl afterwards, and geeks broke it up. Mick Foley was awesome on this show. Mick Foley was a superstar on this program. Sure. That made this one of the best impacts in a long fucking time. I cannot so, say that. Way to go, Mick Foley. The second hour of this show was good. The first hour was fucking terrible. Have you watched Impact lately? This was a great show. Yes. It's been much better than this. I thought this was the worst Impact in a month or so. There you go, everybody. To the back! Let's talk about Impact. The Cross the Line episode of, of Impact. AJ opened the show, talked about how he'd lost to Steiner because of a miscue by Jarrett. He said he was not sure it was actually a miscue. So Jarrett came out, and AJ basically asked him if he could trust him in the cage. And Jarrett's like, how dare you accuse me of potentially turning on you? And AJ said, I didn't say turning on you. You said that. To try and build some, uh, you know, some uh, doubt in the minds of the, the fans right here. So, anyway. Uh, this Jarrett, somehow led to Jeff complaining about the young guys. Well, there's always bitching about that, but I who don't cares? know. This could say confused the hell out of me. Mafia came out. I actually understood every moment in this segment. Angle then came out and said Nash was supposed to wrestle a fourth member of the uh, good guys team on the show today to determine who got the... Uh, it was a tiebreaker. There had been two matches so far. Who got the numbers advantage in uh, war games? But Nash, he said, was not cleared until Sunday. And by the way, they just now figured this out. Yeah. <laughs> this is like Raw now. It's like Vince McMahon. So Angle said, I want to wrestle the guy. And Jarrett said... AJ was not down with this, by the way. He wanted to forfeit because he's right. a, a crying pussy baby. Face. <laughs> he's a coward. Yes. Angle, meanwhile, is a man. His guy can't wrestle, so he's going to fucking step up. And, by the way, he also asked permission. Yeah. So Jared said, fine, you can have him, and I'll announce who this man is later. I like this segment. I give this segment a thumbs up. We have the mad Iraqi doing a promo. the hell out of me. Right? <laughs> what was confusing? AJ asked Jeff Jarrett, no, he did not use his exact words, but he said, are you going to turn on me in this cage match? No, but here's the point. This is the whole point of this. You knew what he was saying. Yeah. This was Jarrett's argument as well. All AJ said was, can we trust you? That was, that was the words he used. Okay. Jarrett came up with the words, turn on you. How, are they different? No, that's what Jarrett was arguing. This is all semantics. Okay. But AJ doesn't trust him. So he assumes you came up with the words turn on me, so that means this is in your mind that you're going to fucking turn on me. He's paranoid. That's stupid. No, this made total sense. No. For Christ's sake, did you watch this show? If AJ already thought Jared was going to trust to turn on him, okay, I'll, 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 here's, if AJ did not trust Jeff, why would he ask him? If, if Jeff had diabolical plans in store for AJ, would he tell him? Would Maybe. he come out here and say, AJ, you can't trust me. Perhaps he was trying to checkmate him, and he did. What? He he was trying to see if Jarrett would admit to thinking about turning on him. <laughs> Jarrett calling Jarrett. This is why this is why your argument about this is stupid. Your argument about it is the same argument Jeff Jarrett made. Jeff, you are playing the role of Jeff Jarrett. Logic. It's a yes. It's supposed to be like that. Jarrett's like. These are semantics you're arguing. That's what Jeff Jarrett said. That was okay. his argument for why he's not turning on the guy. I, I concede that everything Jarrett said made sense. AJ came off like a coward later and a, a, a fool in the yeah, first part of this. exactly. That was the because goal. Because he is. <laughs> he's an idiot. Well, then my confusion there was I do not realize AJ Styles was supposed to be a cowardly, idiotic fool. Well, if you I thought watch, he was a hero. If you watch this show every week, you'd realize that they don't know what they're doing well, in, in that sense. And so, you yes. made it clear to me now. Once and once Angle came out, everything was fine. I was fine with that again. Although, except once again, they had the heels acting heroically and the baby faces acting like pussies. Yeah, but they always do that. Saban, Homicide, and Naito in a three-way type up the three-way tag match in the cage. This was a uh, a great little match and uh, great enough that I actually wanted to see the the full-fledged version at the pay-per-view. Sure. That in fact is a success. Homicide hit the uh, diamond cutter off the middle rope for the uh, pin on Naito. So let's see if we can figure this out. Saban and, and uh, Shelly beat uh, No Limit last week. Homicide got the win here. That means No Limit wins the belts back at the pay-per-view. There that, you go. That would probably make sense. Parody was, booking, everybody. It was one of those matches where it was five minutes long, I believe, consisting of one giant spot. They just did a move, then 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 a move all the way through. It was all fun. The highlight of which by far was... 
they needed a bit where Homicide had to be out of it for a while, so Naido and uh, Saving Deuce's boss. So the way they removed Homicide was he hit a dive onto No Limit, he hit his, his flip tope through the ropes, and he landed on his feet and then kept going and banged his head into the wall. Yes. And then fell down and sold. And I laughed and cackled. It was awesome. Then we had the Balls Mahoney brother Runt appearance on the show. I could not even believe my eyes. Runt has gotten fatter, believe it or not. He's actually put on weight at last. After 15 years in this business? Not good weight, by the way. But And then Abyss was meeting with Cornette, and he was bitching, and then ODB came in, and she was bitching. And so Cornette just basically told them both to fuck off, get partners, and have a match later. And uh, Cody said he wanted to have the match. First off, there were two things here. ODB didn't even know she had a pay-per-view match until this show. Then, after Cody said he wanted to be a partner, she's like, Wait a second. Why are you still here? I thought this was only one night. We have finally found the one person that pays less attention to all this than I do. <laughs> the ODV? Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, I, I, I was... This segment also confused me, mainly because it was too much stuff going on too fast. I thought when they had booked the... the, the Cornette ended up booking a mixed tag with Abyss and the girl versus ODB and a guy, which turned out to be Cody Diener. And uh, I thought he had booked it for the pay-per-view. And the very last thing he says is, We'll see you later tonight. Well, you weren't paying attention because ODB in this very segment was talking about her pay-per-view match, which was not this match. I do recall that. <laughs> and, and Abyss talked about uh, Abyss talked about his match with Morgan, but then Cornette said, hey, you want to wrestle? I don't know. Well, it was because ODB came in and said, why am I on this pay-per-view? I haven't even wrestled in this show in, in weeks. And Cornette said, you're right, so get a partner. I'll get you both out of my hair. All right, I'm just stupid. Whatever. Your, your uh, notes today. When I understand this show, something's wrong. Then we had, uh, what do we have? Oh, the Jarrett interview with Jarrett? <laughs> or Tanae. Oh, Tanae. Mike Tanae and Jeff Jarrett. Your notes. Oh, my notes are obviously bad in that case. So, anyway, they uh, plug the DVD, and then he asked him about Steiner, and Jeff was like, we're, 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 we've been tight for a long time. Jill loved him. The kids love him. But the business has driven a wedge between our friendship. Then he goes, but we're still family friends. That's exactly what? what he said. Yes. What? So anyway, Jared finally just said, I need to take care of Jeff Jarrett first and foremost. So they're teasing he's going to turn. They, they keep showing clips of Jeff and Foley from Memphis in 88, and every time I see that, I think, I must get this DVD. That stuff looks awesome. Borash interviewed the Mafia, and uh, Kurt said he guaranteed his team that he would win tonight, no matter who the opponent was. We got Saeed, Kong, and Taylor against the beautiful people. I have no idea when Kong and Saeed turned babyface. Apparently they did. This went a minute. Kong pinned Angelina, and then... Uh, the, the woman who was challenging her at the pay-per-view. Of course. And then the uh, women all jumped her afterwards and uh, cut a lot of her hair off. And I mean, they cut off all of her bangs, they cut off some stuff off the back... And if you've seen Kong's hair, it's a very intricate, elaborate hairstyle. So this, this, why don't you do a fucking hair match? <laughs> Can someone answer this fucking question for me? This is such a waste of hair for free TV angles. There are no buys. Who is buying the pay-per-view for this match? Nobody. Kong got her hair cut off for literally nothing, which is probably why she was going nuts in the next segment. She got her hair cut off for a shitty segment. She was then backstage throwing a tantrum and screeching and hollering, and Ray, she was trying to calm her down, or she just kept hitting lockers and kicking cans and stuff. It gets better. As they're cutting her hair off for free with no build on impact, they're in the midst of cutting her hair, and Don's like, you know that Jeff Jarrett interview made me think. <laughs> That's right, yes. As, as I wrote down, meanwhile, Don discusses Jarrett. They, they, yes, they, they, if they, I were Kong, I would have walked over and gave him a spinning back fist and laid him out. What a dipshit. God, that made me mad. He, he, this he did, was the stupidest fucking segment on the show. He, he did go out of his way to make you not care about this sacrifice of hair. Then we had the uh, 3D rough cut. 3D rough cut, and then an interview with Lauren. And i got to give these guys credit. They are doing everything in their power to make this seem like the biggest and most historic tag team match in the history of professional wrestling. Which obviously means they're winning, by the way. But they're, they're doing everything in their power. And uh, Runt and Balls showed up. They dropped a bunch of ECW names, including Heyman, who balls completely blew off. And uh, then they left to do an indie show. Or so they said. That's they it. said they left to do an indie show, but the next thing you know, they're they're being beaten up. But that's later. So I don't know if they, they were lying. Maybe they were working Bubba and Devon. 
make it seem like they uh well the thing that they would make employed. sense because you would yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't want your friends to know that you were down in hard times you want to know you're working somewhere so you may may fit a little ODB and Diener against Abyss and Daphne the girls started it was horrendous then uh, the guys tagged in and uh, Cody Diener is fucking awesome uh-huh. Cody Diener is like. One of the most entertaining workers on this entire show. Yeah. Now, granted, he took one move, a black hole slam, but uh, he is just fantastic. I cannot say enough good things. I don't know where the fuck they found this guy. I don't know who trained him, but he's fucking awesome. He may have been from Demore School, actually, but uh, he is fabulous. So he, way to go, Cody Diener. He did more in, in two minutes of inaction. He did more to make you care about his match than anyone else did their show in any of the time they had. Just by, 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 he showed trepidation and fear by getting into the ring, and then he finally manned up, and he did his best against Abyss, and even when it was clear that Doom was intimate, he showed courage, he would not let ODB sub- Doom he, was intimate? I think I said that, I meant imminent. <laughs> it's terrifying. <laughs> ODB is involved. Indeed, and regardless, he, he wanted to protect her, he would not subject her to further risk or harm, and so he took the, uh, he, he took on the monster himself and was killed, and it was, this is, I love this so much. This is my favorite part of the entire show. Not me, because afterwards Matt Morgan came out and beat up Abyss. Oh, that was dumb. Are yeah, actually, you fucking kidding me? This feud is still going on? Yeah, gonna, I don't um, ever, I want to see that, as much as I want to see the Money in the Bank guys doing, doing matches again. They're going to have a match in the pay-per-view, in fact. It's, I do not want to ever see that match again. But uh, to to be fair, what really happened was, or I should say to be accurate, Morgan hit the ring. His first thing to do was to strike a pose. Then he attacked Abyss. Now, God bless Cody Diener, but how can you possibly love that short segment more than the Kurt Angle versus Christopher Daniels main event that went like 15 minutes? I like to laugh. <laughs> you like to laugh. I laughed my ass off at Cody Diener and Abyss. Then we had Borash... And Steiner and Jarrett, and uh, Jarrett or Steiner, oh, Borash interviewed Steiner about Let's Jarrett. Start over Who on this fucking one? cares? Steiner said he wasn't going to talk about Jarrett. Foley interviewed Cactus Jack. This was stolen. Speaking of Gollum, from Lord of the Rings, where he had a conversation with his own other personality, and uh, basically the the conversation was that Mick Foley is a pussy with no heart who hangs out with his family and writes kids books, but Cactus Jack is still a crazed madman who does what the fuck he wants. And uh, he started punching himself repeatedly, busted himself open. Sting came out, called him crazy, and uh, and Foley said, you know, I, I uh, this is the Sting that I want to see at the pay-per-view. And the Mafia music played. Sting turned to see who was coming out. Foley beat him up and then announced that he was, in fact, in charge of this place. He could play any music he wanted. He played Curry Man's music, Shark Boy's music, and then Sting's music. And then uh, they played it off like he completely lost his mind. And uh, thumbs up. Okay, I, I lied about the Cody, Cody, Cody Diener segment. This was the highlight of the show. This was, yeah. Th- Mick Foley managed to get heel heat on himself. <laughs> he, he would say something as Mick Foley and the fans would cheer. And then he would say something as Cactus Jack, cutting down Foley, and the fans would boo. It was tremendous stuff. And Sting came out and, and he said Foley was crazy and everything and... I loved everything about this except Don West, because as the segment was winding down, I believe Sting's music was playing, and Foley was, creep- was skulking out of the ring, I would say. Don West said, boy, that was entertaining. As if to say, you know, it it's was all fake, yes, everybody. Exactly. He, he did not say he was enthralled. He did, he did not express any emotional reaction except that he had fun watching it. Yes. So, yeah. there you go, everybody. That was uh, that little segment. And uh, then we had Beer Money jumping balls and spike backstage. They dragged them to the ring. They uh, broke a bottle over uh, Balls' head. They hit him with several unprotected chair shots. They beat the shit out of him. They hit him with more stuff. They gave him chair shots. They beat on him. They hit him with stuff. They gave him moves. Put him to a table. Over and over again. And I'm like, where in the fuck is Team 3D? This was a good angle to put heat on the main event, but it was one of those angles where it went on way too long, to the point of complete absurdity. Was there a buffet somewhere? I was going to say. <laughs> was there was there something that was of such pressing importance that Bubba and Devon fucking Dudley could not come out and save their brother and their friend? I mean, they beat on him for like three minutes. 
before Team 3D finally came out. So this was completely stupid. Perhaps they were on the Hulk coaster. And uh, it got actually dumber. Bubba cut a, a promo that was full of passion. In that sense, it was good. But uh, then they announced that their cage match of the pay-per-view is now a cage match outside a steel cage. <laughs> it's a cage match where they're going to open the door and the guys just leave the cage and fight. Yes. They are so mad. They're so mad at beer money that they don't want them inside a cage. Yes. Idiotic. And, and, and the, the way this all went down was... But Brother Ray declared they were angry at, at Beer Money. Who, who was defiant, by the way? They asked, how can you do this to our friends and to our brother? And Beer Money said, because we can. And they smiled and were cackling. And finally, Brother Ray said, at lockdown, it's going to be a street fight. And suddenly, Beer Money were saying, no, no, because they were cowardly heels. And then Mike Tenet explained what this meant, what this match meant. He said, we're going to open the door. And as you said, you ran down these stupid, stupid, stupid steps. So Brother Ray booked the match. <laughs> Uh, beer money didn't immediately knew what it was, but also didn't want it. But there was something they could do to, to get the stiff taken out. And Mike and they also immediately knew what was going on, and he explained it to us, and that was that. A lot to hate here. So yeah, I uh, was not a big fan of that uh, wacky little thing right there. But uh, what the hell can you do? Then we had Lauren interviewing uh, AJ about um, God knows what, and uh, Jarrett came out to uh, do a promo. Oh, he said he didn't t uh, trust Jarrett. So Angle came out for the main event, and then Jarrett came out and said he was proud to welcome back the fourth and final member of the team, Christopher Daniels. AJ was so happy, he kissed Lauren, which is going to make Abyss and AJ's wife both very upset. And uh, Angle was just baffled. Daniels got in the ring, and, and uh, I could be imagining things, but I could have sworn he got on the apron, he flashed the suicide sign, and then he mouthed, and I quote, I never left! A bunch of fans were holding up suicide signs as well, which is funny because suicide is wrestling on the pay-per-view, as is uh, Chris Daniels. They had a match. It was a fucking great match. Not as good as the uh, the uh, John Morrison match on ECW, I don't think, but uh, it was a pretty damn good match. Angle's, Angle works a very fast style, and a lot of people cannot keep up with him. Chris Daniels had zero problem keeping up with him. Indeed. They uh, did a ton of near falls there at the finish. And uh, finally, Daniels pinned him with a uh, rolling cradle, but uh, there was controversy. Angle started screaming and freaking out. Cornette came out. Angle noted that his shoulder was up. Cornette said, uh, well, uh, I'll see what I can do. And Angle was so mad he spat on him, and so Cornette told him, well, fine. I hereby declare you a loser. So Angle flipped out even more. And then uh, after commercial, Jarrett came out, and they said he'd been in the uh, truck the entire time going over the tape. And he said he'd watch from several angles. He said he knew this was very important because the winner determined the guy that got the man advantage. They showed the tape. Angle had, in fact, gotten his shoulder up. Jared said as the founder, he had to make some easy decisions, some hard decisions. But in the end, he had to make the right decision, whether he liked it or not. And so he announced Kurt as the winner, which, of course, made his team, they were completely baffled. They were angry. They were screaming at him. Angle hugged Jarrett. Jarrett shoved him off. And the program, I'll ignore the Samoa Joe part at the end because that was just dumb, but the entire show ended with uh, the the tease that Jeff Jarrett is, in fact, going to turn because he ruled in favor of Kurt Angle, even though it was, in fact, the, <laughs> right, the right decision. Call. Yeah, well, that's Thanks. why this whole thing was great. Hey, well, I guess that's... This, this is a, a true storyline where you don't know whether or not he's going to turn, and uh, and actually, I don't even give a fuck if he turns or not because either way, it's going to make sense. That is a great swerve. They're actually doing no, something I will, I will completely fucking correct. If he turns on him, we can look back and go, well, yeah, duh. And uh, if he doesn't, we can also look back and go, well, duh. So this is great. I, I, I can see your point there, but all the, the, the match was great. No, no complaints about the match. It was it was very good. The when Jarrett announced, I have to announce. Uh, they show the replay, and the replay it is crystal clear. The execution by both wrestlers and the referee was perfect. There's a cradle. Both men's shoulders were down, which, by the way, I didn't notice Daniel's shoulders were down until this replay. So that's that, that's also a bonus to them. But Daniel's shoulders were down for a count of three. Angle's were down for a count of two. That makes Kurt Angle the winner. When Jared made this announcement, why his own men turned on him, I don't know. And uh, they, they come off again like whining pussies. They wanted to, to be the cheating done in their favor. And I guess maybe this is... 
they're, they're, they're thinking about? Because maybe I thought, you know, if I was Jarrett, maybe I would turn on these assholes. I, I, I guess if their goal was to, say, tune in the pay-per-view to see whether or not Jarrett will turn on his team, I, and they accomplished their goal. I well, just, that's the uh, that's why I, you tune in I, and to see I, the matches. Just I just hate that I hate that concept. Uh-huh. I want I want to if you're going to do a team match, have it be team A against team B, and they hate they like their friends, but they hate each other. And we're seeing this as the main event, or at least the co-main event of two pay per views. I believe in the next two weeks, and they're fucking them both up. Well, this will be better than the next one. I, at least the title is not on the line in a fucking six man. You have a point there. To the back. Vinny is here to talk about the TNA pay-per-view from this evening. Let's uh, run it down here and and see what we have to see. It opened up on the pre-show with Danny Bonaducci and Eric Young. Bonaducci, of course, a Philadelphia radio personality. I guess he was supposed to be the babyface based on how this match went, but he was booed vociferously. Eric Young was cheered. They had a, an acceptable professional wrestling battle. It was likely better than the main event. They uh, did a couple of things. Uh, Bonaducci went for his uh, senton, actually hit it, and they kind of screwed up a small package for the pin. Afterwards, he, uh, this being Bonaducci, grabbed some nunchucks that he had brought into the ring, and he tried to uh, hit Eric Young with them and ended up with Rhino coming down and goring him into next week. A brutal gore, and this was shockingly fine. We saw him having matches on Hogan Celebrity Wrestling with other, frankly, amateur pro wrestlers. Here he was in there with a really, really good guy. So it was much better than anything he did on the Hogan show. Uh, he came out with the nunchucks. He spun them around and and tried to look badass. It didn't really work, but it was something different. Uh, it actually started, he came out. Actually, he dropped them. He did drop them. I, I could not decide if I was, he did that on purpose for heel heat or not, but it was effective. But he, the first thing he did, he had a promo with Lauren. And Lauren asked him what he had done to prepare for this match, and he said, well, I've been working on my bumps. Call yeah. Then, then at the end of the interview, he said, thank you, Lauren, and he walked away. And I think it was the first time anyone had ever been nice to her, and she was so bewildered. She did not know how to react to politeness. I've worked on my bumps as much as I can, he said. And yes, based on the way that this match was worked, he did not mean to drop the nunchucks. He was not trying to be a heel in this match. Well, he did come out and bite Ethan's finger, also. Well, that could have been like some radio show deal. Maybe there's a heel host. I don't know. It would be like if you were in the front row. I'd immediately try to attack you. That would be a shoot. Then we had Borash introducing Dixie Carter, who made her first television appearance, basically thanking us for crossing the line, helping them break records week in and week out, she said. And, uh... I'll talk about her more later. I just like uh, Borash said one of the different things about TNA is that we are not owned by an egotistical millionaire businessman. No, you're owned by an egotistical billionaire or millionaire businesswoman. Yeah, big difference. He just talked about how she's a nice mother of two from Texas, and then of course later on in the show, there's Abyss bleeding all over glass and fully hitting dudes with barbed wire bats. And I decided, what the fuck is this woman thinking in the front row as she watches all this? This mother of two. Is she cheering and marking out? I, I wish they would have had a Dixie cam. We had AJ and Daniels arriving without the rest of their crew. And then, of course, Angle and his crew all arrived together. So they were teasing Unity versus non-Unity. And uh, then Bub and Devon did a, a good promo. It was It was so clear for weeks now, actually, that they were winning these titles because they were trying so hard yes. to make this seem like the biggest match in the history of wrestling. Right. And it was like, if you guys are losing the beer money, there's no way you're going through all this trouble. So it was clear, but they did a hell of a job. So it actually was one of the matches I was most looking forward to on the show and was probably the best match on the show. It did definitely had the best reaction, but this is a very good promo. Uh, the only problem with it was they cut it on the steps of the uh, Philadelphia Museum, the, the Rocky steps where he ran up there. And uh, on on the on it was a good promo and delivery, and it was good that it was there. It showed they were local on the scene. They were at a, a historic site, and they were pumping up the the importance of the location. The problem was they're cutting this promo, and people are walking around, and they did not give two shits about Bubba and Devon. Of course not. They were not stars. They were just two fat guys with a camera. X Division escaped the cage. Kyoshi suicide consequences. Creed, Jay Lethal, and Sheik Bashir started with five guys. Eliminated via pinfall or submission. When there were two guys left, the first guy to escape the cage won. Got all that, everybody? Of course. Can never be simple in TNA. So it came down to, um, and by the way, 
suicide in this match was Chris Daniels, who was, in fact, also working the semi-main. He started this match and went all the way to the end. And at the end, he did a dive off of the cage onto Kiyoshi and a couple of uh, security guys, which was one of the more spectacular spots on the show. The place went nuts. It looked awesome. Chris Daniels has got to be the craziest fucker I've ever seen because he literally put his life into the hands of three men, and he was still working a match later on in this same show. A complete nut. He has taken some crazy risks. For but a great man. A, a, a yes, uh, a, a fine, fine athlete, a, a charismatic individual, and all that. But yes, he did some crazy, crazy risks for a guy who just I don't know. He seems like he should be smarter than this. Like I expect AJ Styles to just kind of be a dumb redneck. Well, Daniels, it was perfect. It was perfect. It and went perfectly. The thing with Daniels is, I will say this about Daniels. Daniels does some things that in a million years I would never do, and I see him do them, and I go, "What a dumb shit!" But he always succeeds. And he, yeah. Whereas AJ does dumb shit, and he often fails. He'll do a dumb shit like tonight, he, for example. Like a, well, tonight was a, tonight was actually a fine example, but he'll do like a paley on the floor on the floor and just land on his head. But the match was a big mess with five guys in the ring early. Sadly, suicide did not ride his zipline into the cage. I was hoping he would come down in a zipline and crash on the outside of the cage wall like a bird hitting a car window or something. But sure. But no, he disappeared. And like I say, it was a cluster early with just too many bodies in the cage, which was the story of the night, really. Uh, once you get down to the two guys, first of all, there are three guys, I believe Consequence, uh, no, excuse me, Lethal was the third guy, and, uh, the Sheik pinned him. So now it's down to Sheik and, and Suicide, and the first one out wins. And all I like to think was, they're opening the door right now to get Jay Lethal out of the ring. Jump out! Well, I Sheik. thought that too. Apparently there, there are rules about doing that sort of thing. I, 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 yeah. Of course, it was never told what those rules I, were. I thought the Sheik was best being stupid, so, it, that was dumb, but then he had a pretty fun little match, and, and then, Daniels, or excuse me, pardon me, suicide uh, was about to was about to climb down and win when Kiyoshi came out to slow him down, and that that gave the Sheik time to crawl for the door. And there was a great shot where Daniels, who is one of those guys who shows more, more charisma in the mask than sometimes he does wrestling, but he is up there in his mask. And he looks at the pile of guys on the floor, looks at the Sheik about to win, looks at the pile of guys on the floor, looks at the Sheik about to win, and realizes his only chance is to do a suicidal move and dive onto the pile of guys. And it was it was fine, fine stuff. And this was, by the end, this was a perfectly fine opener. It was a perfect dive at the, uh, at the end of the match as well. Awesome finish. I gave the match three stars. It was a good match. It wasn't great or anything like that. Finish was cool. We had the Queen of the Cage match, which was Madison, ODB, Sojo Bolt, and Daphne, Queen of the Cage. Last year, this was a reverse cage match. You had to climb in, and the first two people in had a match. Instead, they just threw all the girls in this year, which was better. It was still horrendous. Who was it that said that the I, match I wasn't even that bad? This match was fucking horrible. I wrote, I wrote this fucking sucks, exclamation point. That was my, like, my notes in the whole body of the match. Horrible match. ODB got her flask. She spat liquor into Bolt's eyes, pinned her with a horrible power slam. A slam. Thankfully, it was short. Yeah, there's nothing much to it. The, the other highlight was Mike Tanay turning to Don West and asking, has the paperwork been completed yet? Is Madison Rain part of the beautiful people? Paperwork. Paperwork. Yeah. I demand to see this paperwork. Well, maybe the paperwork is for the plastic surgeon. I see. That's actually a fine point. The best part was the announcers had no idea if ODB got a title shot due to this. No, they they, they assumed it was possible. They thought I mean, perhaps she has moved to the front of the line now for the title shot. But no, apparently the winner was just queen of the cage with nothing officially on the line. They also did not explain whether it was a single pinfall or elimination until long into the match. Jared arrived and in a nice car, of course. And they kept noting that Samoa Joe and his nation of violence had not arrived yet. And I kept thinking, how would he arrive? Canoe? What would, he, what would he be in to arrive here as the nation of violence? I don't picture this this version of Samoa Joe showing up, for example, in a Hummer. just wouldn't work out. Or a Volvo. We never saw him show up. We only saw him once he arrived. A land bridge, for example. Maybe horseback. We had uh, Motor City Machine Guns, LAX, and No Limit for the junior tag team titles. This had an awesome moment from Mike Tanay. Of course, we've been asking, why the fuck is Hernandez in this junior title match? And I had come up with this this uh, this scenario where you explain that the junior title limit is say 215 pounds. Okay. So that means the the combined weight is 435 pounds. Sure. So you claim that if you add homicide, wait, 430 pounds. If you add homicide and Hernandez up, you only get 429. 
I, that, that, that that's logical. That would be that would be uh, lying about homicide. I don't know if it's true, but at least it's a logical thought. You would have to assume homicide was maybe 150 pounds. I was thinking perhaps just only one guy had to be a junior, which would indicate you should not get Hernandez. You should get I don't know, Big Show. Well, anyway, they can they explain that. You see, in Japan, he says the IWGP Junior Belts are like the X title, because of the X title, of course, is it's not about weight limits; it's about no, no limits. limits. This would be fine if the fucking titles were not called the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Titles. That does imply a weight limit. The weight limit is in the name of the belts. He tried. He failed. So they had this match. It was fun. They all did a whole bunch of, of uh, wacky spots, that sort of thing. Not a lot of heat, quite frankly. There was a little bit when, when Hernandez was, was throwing dudes around. But at points during this match, it was quite distressing how little heat this was. And Hernandez finally gave Saban a border toss into the side of the cage. He fell straight down into his head. We thought he died. Everybody kind of hit a move. Uh, and then finally, the guns hit Naito with a stacked up sliced bread for the clean pin. Good match. Surprised to uh, see the titles stay with the machine guns, but what the hell. I gave it, uh, I'd say, three and a quarter to three and a half, somewhere around in there, whatever you want. Not a big deal either way. It was, it was similar to the other matches in that for most of the time there was just too many bodies in the ring laying around to, to get in guys' ways, and it occurred to me that any two of these teams would have had a better match than what we had here with this third team. So in an effort, in an effort to be nice and get everyone on the show, they made the show worse. So way to go, TNA. Uh, that it started early, they, they all kind of paired off and started brawling, and the deal was you'd have two guys brawling in opposite corners, and the other two guys would be doing spots in the middle of the ring. Well, that makes sense. They fooled the director, though, because the director decided to focus on the guys brawling in the corner, and we could just hear bumps being taken and stuff. So, way to go, TNA director. I will get back to you later. So they had the little match. There was not a lot of heat. People did not care about it. I can't really disagree with them. I like the opener better. Uh, the finish was really good once the machine guns started running wild and hitting other double teams, and they won and had their belts, so... It was fine. It was above average, I guess, by the end, but it was nothing special. Matt Morgan and Abyss, again, nobody cared. They did a bunch of stuff. They got cut open. Actually, a Morgan, Abyss got cut open because the story was you could not pin somebody unless that person was bleeding. Right, so, so you think the story would be we have to work each other over so that when one of us finally gets blood, it will be a big dramatic moment. No, Abyss bled two minutes in. Yep, they did moves. Then Morgan gigged. Then the ref took a bump. Abyss hit the black hole slam, but there was no ref. He left the cage and got a chair. Keep in mind there had been glass in the cage. Right. But he left the cage to get a chair. Mm -hmm. So he goes to get a chair because glass is not dangerous enough. Dr. Stevie came out. Stevie Richards, of course. This is the first time he's, I guess, shown his face on television. And Mike Tanay had no idea that Dr. Stevie was Stevie Richards. So... Abyss ate a big boot after Stevie distracted him, but of course that was not the finish. Things kept going on. Stevie was telling Abyss not to use the chair, no more violence. And uh, then Abyss got another black bag, poured the tax on the canvas. Stevie hit the ring and began beating him up. And then Morgan gave Abyss a low blow and hit the sidewalk slam on the tax for the pin. It was not completely awful. It was overbooked. Nobody cared about anything. I give it a star and a half. That's very generous. It's not like they were falling over each other or anything, but there was a long portion of this match where the the the, the, the action, as such as it was, was limited to Stevie Richards yelling at Abyss at ringside. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's well, bad. Played and, into the storyline. I guess. Unfortunately, sure. nobody in the building knew about the storyline, apparently. No, but the, although we should mention Stevie Richards' appearance got... Until the 3D match, the largest pop in the show by leaps and bounds. Yeah. They were very happy to see Stevie in Philadelphia. So there's also a point here where Abyss grabbed the fake glass, and, and uh, Morgan was not yet bleeding. So Abyss grabs the shard of glass and smashes it across Morgan's face. Don West, heel announcer, then began to criticize this, apparently because he smashed the glass instead of using it in a stabbing motion. He said, if you're going to stab a man, if you're going to slice a man open with a shard of glass, you should do it the proper way. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So this was fucking miserable. I hated it. If you want to give it a star and a half, go ahead. But I don't ever want to see anything like this ever again. Awesome Kong, Angelina Love, Taylor Wilde, three-way for the knockouts title. Awesome Wild. wait, Wild Kong Love. Wild Kong Love. Actually, Awesome Wild Kong Love. <laughs> There's many things you can play with this. Anyway, they had a match. It was actually pretty good early. 
It was pretty good per current TNA women's match standards. And then it completely fell apart. Actually, it got great, and then it fell apart. Kong scaled the Empire State Building, got all the way to the top rope, did a fucking flip-dive leg drop, crashed and burned, just got the biggest pop on the show by far, and then... Uh, That's a wrestling move. She was down, and they uh, they grabbed her, and they went, and they tied her... Uh, no, this got the biggest pop of anything up to this point. This was a bigger pop than Stevie. They uh, tied Kong's hair to the uh, cage, and this was uh, the beautiful people. So then Angelina ends up in the middle of the ring, and Taylor does a high cross, and Angelina does the bump, whereas you're about to take it, you leap into the air so that you take an even bigger bump, and she proceeded to hit the back of her head on the canvas and knock herself out. Completely out. And I guess Angelina, or uh, Taylor made the cover, had to help her up. Made another cover, lifted her up again, then kind of hurt her up and put her in a chin lock, giving her time to, I guess, come back to life. And they sat there for a while. The match completely died. Nobody had any idea what to do. So they came up with the following finish, everybody. Awesome Kong is tied by her hair to the cage. She's on her back. She can't move. Her hair is tied to the cage. Apparently, Raisha Saeed is unable to untie a uh, a bow, a bow knot. So, Taylor gets up, and she walks over to Kong. She bends down to look at her, apparently says, kick me. Kong gives her a up kick, straight out of UFC. Taylor Wilde takes a back bump. Angelina pins her. It was comically ridiculous. Angelina had recovered at this point enough to smile and hold up her belt at the end, but it was scary. It became a disaster, and uh, it sucks because it was good up until that point. That is all true. And uh, the, the final shot here was the, the referee helping Angelina stand and, and hold up her belt, and she was smiling. I don't know where, well, where Velvet Sky was, because upon the finish, which caught her off guard as well, she realized her partner had won, the music was playing, the camera was on her, she started to clap and jump up and down, which was a fine sight, and then she never got in the cage. So I don't know what happened to her. So Kong then had a fit, probably in and out of character at the same time, start, still tied to the cage, started slapping the mat, slapping the cage, furious that it had all fallen apart like this. It was a, a, a low point, although I can't really say, boy, TNA, you were stupid to do this. It was just kind of a, kind of a shit happens moment. So a giant thumbs down for it, regardless. Kong's hair is awesome, and of course, on impact, the beautiful people cut off her bangs, and she's now got bangs that hang down to about her eyebrows. They are... They're frayed where they have been cut badly. Frayed at the ends. It looks so horrible. I, I realize I sound like a gay hairdresser here, but let's be honest. It looks horrible, and there's nothing she can do about this. It is going to take a year for her hair to grow out back to the level where it was before it was cut. And for what? For an angle on impact that nobody cared about. Right. It led to this match where she lost. Nobody cared. It didn't add a single buy. And uh, there you go. Welcome to TNA. That you didn't can even get TNA an extra for. payoff. Didn't even get a hair match angle out of this. She just got her hair cut off. God, this was horrible. Then uh, Team 3D, Beer Money for the IWGP and TNA Tag Team titles. Before the match, 3D cut a promo with the fans out in the building and beer. Uh, the only thing really remarkable about this, about this promo was Lauren was there. Earlier in the show, she'd interviewed Abyss, was very concerned about his safety, wanted to make, wanted him to get out of the match and was concerned he'd be hurt badly. She was correct. He was hurt badly. This is the first time we had seen her since. She was smiling and having a good old time. Of course. Of course. They did do one great interview, which was right after the suicide match. They immediately cut that yes. stage to an interview with Angle and Chris Daniels. Yes. That was awesome. That was great. Then we had the uh, Team 3D matches noted. They they brawled in the crowd. They came back in the ring, in the uh, cage and did a bunch of stuff. This was a street fight, by the way. The street cage fight. was just there for decoration. Street fight with a cage. So they did all their stuff and, and um, ended up with... Uh, the director during this match, by the way, we've complained about the TNA director before, but new standards in this. Oh match. my God, Bubba did a full Nelson ass buster off the top rope, which in most matches would probably be a finish. Hit it on Robert Roode. The director decided to show us about 17 replays during the pinfall attempt. So we're watching these replays and we hear, and we hear Tanae going nuts, and I'm thinking, who covered who and what happened? 
no idea. So, of course, then they cut back and something else happened, and Tay screamed, what did he hit him with? Nobody knows. So they had this match, and aside from the, the idio- uh, idiocracy, idiocy of the of the director, it was uh, pretty good. Rude finally told them to, uh, or to, told uh, Storm to slam the cage door on Devon's head, but uh, Devon switched. Rude went face first into the door. Babyface hit the 3D for the pin. Fun match. Place went nuts. I think they like this match more than anything else on the show. Yeah, well, the place, yeah, absolutely. This got the, by far and away the best crowd reaction. Uh, probably far and away the best match when all, when all said and done. You know, far and away, but it was the best match overall. And, uh, <laughs> as far as all the wrestling goes, you guys all did great. I'm very happy with you men. Mr. TNA Director, your issues began before the match started. It this appeared to be a deliberate attempt to sabotage the match and ruin anyone's enjoyment of it. As, uh, Beer Money came out, they did their stick. They got in the ring. 3D's music's playing. Video's on the wall. Camera cuts the entrance way. Stays there for a long time. Cuts to a shot of the crowd. There's just people milling around. And uh, then I realized one of these men is dancing. And I was like, holy crap, that dancing guy there, that's Devon Dudley. So this entrance through the crowd apparently fooled the TNA director. He was not aware. So they got in the cage. They started wrestling. It, it, it immediately went to crowd brawling. As they are want to do in 3D, and uh, they, they 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 paired off and they brought up separate stairwells and up to uh, the the luxury box area, and uh, Devon and I believe Rude disappeared out one door. They just disappeared, gone. So they cut to Bubba Ray and James Storm, and uh, Bubba Ray stepped into the into the luxury box and stepped behind a behind a door, presumably to grab some plunder, food, beverages, a garbage can. I don't know. He stepped in there to grab the plunder. The, the director then cuts to the doorway where Devon and, Stor- and, and and Rude had disappeared through. We saw fans running through this doorway. We stayed there for several seconds, and we saw all the fans point to over where Bubba Ray and, and Storm were, were doing their stuff. Seconds later, we cut back. Whatever Bubba Ray did, we missed it. We don't know. So they kept rolling. They rolled down the stairs. They can't, they, they, they was, fans were right in their face. They, they were too close to each other to really do anything, but they had a camera right there. Bubba Ray turns to the camera. The camera's six inches from his face, and he screams, Watch this! And he grabs his opponent, and he raises his fist, and the director cuts away. Dumb! There is more. Team, uh, Beer Money did their Beer Money suplex. They did it off stairs to a table, and Rude ended up tumbling down, and, and thankfully just kind of landed on his back, and he was okay. So they went to do the big cheer. The ref missed that. They've been doing this cheer for like six months now. The ref still doesn't understand how it works. Uh, we mentioned the, the other spot where the Bubba Ray hit the full Nelson ass buster off the top rope, and we did not see the near fall or any of the uh, ensuing aftermath because we were watching replays of this move. There was an even better one later where the Dudleys hit the, uh, the, the Doomsday device. They hit the Road Warriors finisher, and they made a cover, and the fans chanted one, the fans chanted two, and the director then cut to a shot of Bubba Ray's ass. No fucking buys. No fucking buys. So there was more, but uh, when all was said and done, very fine match. One goddamn shitty television product by a complete amateur. Then we had the uh, lethal lockdown war game style match. Jarrett, Joe, Styles, Daniels against Angle, Nash, Booker T, and Scott Steiner. And Angle and Daniels started. This was good. And then we had Booker come in rather nonchalantly. The best part of this was uh, Daniels puts Angle in the Koji clutch. And time's running out, and finally the time limit expires, and it's time for Booker T to come and save Kurt Angle. What does Booker do? He calmly marches onto the stage. He looks around. He strikes his pose. Does a dance. He. Uh, and meanwhile, in the ring, Kurt Angle taps out to the Koji clutch. Of course, the finish can't come until all the men are in the ring. But Kurt Angle just tapped out to Chris Daniels. Do you think the announcers made any mention of this whatsoever? I, I bet not. Of course not. No. Not a single mention of it. So Booker comes in, and then who came in after that? Uh, then AJ. AJ, and then, then Steiner. Steiner, Nash. I will say this: for this match, the, the 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 first portion of this match. You know when this match started, there was called War Games: The Match Beyond, and War Games is the part where guys entered, and the match beyond was when everyone was in there, and you had to make someone quit. The War Games portions of the portion of this match, they did the best job of it I, I, I've seen in years, it seems. It seems like no one ever gets this right anymore, but for this one, it was even for the first five minutes, but it ended with a baby face on top. Then the heels came in to get a 2-on-1 advantage. Uh, they, they got the advantage. 
Daniels made a little comeback, but was eventually overwhelmed, and he was beaten down two-on-one until his buddy AJ came in and ran wild. The faces dominated until Steiner came in to make a three-on-two. Heels dominated for a while, and then Joe came in to make a three-on-three. He ran wild, and everything was going just great. And uh, up until all eight guys got in the ring, I was like... I love this match. I absolutely Actually, love I this. do have to disagree somewhat. They they saved it at the very last second, but seven guys were in the ring. The last guy that was supposed to come out was Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett was supposed to come out and, and save the day for the baby faces. Unfortunately, until about 15 seconds before Jeff Jarrett came out, the baby faces were beating okay, on yes. the heels. You, you are correct. Three on four. You're the baby correct. faces were destroying the heels. <laughs> my, my, my notes do read, faces run wild, three on four, heels take over with seconds left. Yes, yes with seconds correct. left, the heels finally figured out, oh shit, <laughs> we're supposed to be beating on these guys so Jarrett can come out and save the day. So, of course, Jarrett came out and nobody gave a fuck that he hit the ring because this had been set up poorly. So they lowered the cage with all the weapons, and in this got to be a complete clusterfuck. They lowered the cage, and, and there was a light show, and they started playing Butter with Butterfly Wings for the 85th time on the show. And I thought they were going to leave the song playing the whole time, and it would be kind of funny to have this match in Philadelphia with all the plunder, and the song playing is not Natural Born Killers, it's Smashing Pumpkins. But music stopped anyway. They all hit each other with plunder. Angle climbed up onto the top of the cage. I don't know why. AJ followed him up. They I don't know brawled. why they did that either. They teased throwing each other off the cage. Angle gave him a low blow and climbed back into the cage. The heels on the inside destroyed all the baby faces. And then AJ on the top of the cage decided he was going to do a big splash onto the top of the cage, break through, and land on all the heels. Unfortunately, and I have no idea how he managed to do this, he splashed in such a way that he hit one of the supporting beams, which spun him sideways in midair. He managed to fall down, and not a single one of the four baby faces laid a single hand on him to catch him. He crashed and burned on the mat. This would kill most men. <laughs> this is not healthy. Instead, not only did not kill AJ, but he was back on his feet one minute later doing high spots. So that was a waste of time. The crowd chanted, that was awesome. All I could think was, if I ever go to one of these shows, if something that happens, I'm going to start you, that was stupid chant. Jared tried to hit Booker with a chair and hit AJ. And, of course, Don was trying to claim he did this on purpose. Today was trying to say, no, he didn't. Finally came down to Jeff getting his guitar. He teased hitting AJ, but then hit Booker, allowing AJ to get the pin. So Jared did not turn on his team. And I guess it was a swerve of a swerve of a swerve. I don't know, but that's what happened. And uh, a clusterfuck, but I have seen significantly worse from TNA. And then afterwards, they did the big angle, which wasn't even an angle. The lights just went out. Bobby Lashley came out. Kurt Angle acted all happy, and Jared acted very concerned. That was the end. Mm -hmm. As Bobby was, was posing, they cut backstage for interviews with Foley and Sting. I don't know what the point was. I guess just to tell us that Bobby Lashley is here. They didn't even do some sort of angle to uh, to rush him in. It was just, he's now in TNA. Yeah, exactly. And they chose that time right then to announce his presence. I, I just love the, well, the whole point of the main event mafia was they were the guys who had all been world champions, and they were, uh, you know, committed to teaching these young guys respect, and here they are apparently teaming with the young guy. Yep. So then we uh, got the Foley versus Sting main event, which, um, or yeah, Foley versus Sting for the TNA title. And Foley was super over at the beginning, and Sting got some boos. It started out okay. They did some suplexes off the top rope and that sort of thing. And then it really started to slow down. Sting did a stinger splash to his leg, worked it over. The fans chanted, boring. They did some more moves. Foley wanted them to open up the cage. The ref would not allow it. So Foley, instead of... I guess intimidating the ref, forcing the ref. Foley just decided to try something else. So he proceeded to do a baseball slide drop kick and hit the cameraman outside. Because you see the cameraman filmed through a hole in the chain link, so he figured if he drop kicked the cameraman, he could climb through the hole. This is Mick Foley. Yeah. Not Huey Foley. <laughs> he attempted to climb through, his stomach was too fat. So he then began screaming, give me the bat! There was a barbed wire bat outside. Who gave him the bat, you ask? Why, the cameraman that he drop kicked. Why? I don't know. Don West didn't know. Mike Today didn't know. Nobody knew. 
So they said, well, he must have intimidated the cameraman. How? He was stuck in a fucking hole. He was in a scorpion. How was he intimidating this cameraman? I don't know. So, of course, that made absolutely no sense. So he gets this barbed wire bat. They start hitting each other with it. Actually, first Foley tried to hit Sting, but he kept missing. He's trying to hit a 50-year-old man with a bat, and he can't get him. Did some more stuff. Sting started to bleed. They hit each other more. Then Foley decided this barbed wire baseball bat is not enough. I must get my sock. So he got his sock. He wrapped the barbed wire around the sock and punched Sting. I would rather be punched with a barbed wire sock than struck with a barbed wire bat. So then he is running in a corner. And then all of a sudden, just out, kind of out of nowhere, they both decided to race out of the cage. Foley is significantly fatter than Sting. He had gravity on his side. He fell down and therefore won. Right. He was so fat, he fell down from halfway up, and that made him the TNA World Champion in 2009. I gave this a star. That sounds about right. It was very slow. It was very plodding. It was, it was very, it was, it was very non-intense. And Dave mentioned after WrestleMania that watching the, the Legends match with Steamboat and those guys, he mentioned that was sad. I was much sadder watching this, actually. Watching, maybe it's because that was presented as a, a, a mid card. I don't know if comedy act is the right word, but it's a mid card deal. This is supposedly a main, main event feud, and it was no good at all. It, it was two old men, two old, one fat, both pre, probably pretty darn wealthy men, uh, just just rolling around a ring for a while. Uh, they hit each other with this fake barbed wire a dozen times. And Sting finally said, "Fine," and bled. And I, I, he bled this little trickle of blood. I have cut myself worse shaving than he bled here, but I do not blame him one iota. In fact, I would not have gave at all for this fake bat, because this match is going to be garbage regardless. So he, Sting is more of a trooper than I am. So good for him. But it was, like I say, no good in any way. What the hell else happened here? Foley climbed out at the end, even though he could not climb earlier. He had Sting down and tried to climb and couldn't do it. So... It went on for whatever. Ever. Oh, here's what I was going to mention. I've been killing time trying to remember this point. At the beginning of the show, they were talking about how Sting had been champion since October. Yeah. Six months. Yeah. They claimed this to be the longest TNA title reign in company history. The titles. The company's been around for going on seven years now. No one's been champion for more than six months. Yeah. And now that reign's over. Yeah, it's over. For a fat author. As of... 12.32 a.m. Eastern, Douglas Nunnally sent me this email. If you go to TNA right now, they have four graphics, which you would think would be promoting their top four news items. Item one is Sacrifice coming up. Item two is Kevin Nash versus AJ Styles for the Legends title on Impact. Item three is Team 3D's new shirt. <laughs> Item four is the new Jeff Jarrett DVD. They have the world title change hands, the tag team titles change hands, and the women's title change hands, but the selling of T-shirt for said tag title change is more important than acknowledging what actually happened. I will also add they had uh, Jeff Jarrett's loyalty was established, and Bobby Lashley debuted. Yeah. But more importantly, 3D has a shirt. Team 3D has a new shirt. Way to go, TNA. I will conclude, as I began, they were on a roll for several weeks, but it is clear when the chips are down... These people have no idea what they're doing, which does not surprise me. To the back! Oh, this program. There was, like, one fantastically awesome moment. There was some stuff that was okay. There was actually a lot of wrestling, but there was also a lot of crap. Last week, there was a lot of non-wrestling, but all the non-wrestling was good, so you didn't realize there was so little wrestling. This time, there was a lot of wrestling, but you didn't realize it because there was so much crap. There was a streak of like a dozen non-wrestling segments in a row. It opened up with, with Jarrett coming out and introducing Foley to give him his title. And he gave him the belt, and then he said, I, I, must, uh, I must alert you now. You'll be defending the title in a four-way at sacrifice. He said, if you get pinned, you'll be sacrificing the title. But the guys you're facing, we're going to determine those men by what they are willing to sacrifice. The audience, by the way, was dead silent for this. <laughs> so Foley looked baffled and then basically turned heel. He was heel, baffled, as it turns out. And he said, listen, you and I are in charge of this company. I didn't make this match, so clearly you did. So fuck you. And I am going to make a match for you now. You are going to have to go out tonight and wrestle Scott Steiner 
in a special match, a Cactus Jack Smack Attack, to which Jarrett said, what did you just call it? <laughs> Jarrett said a Cactus Jack Smack Attack, and uh, Jarrett said, I can't wrestle, I got a hamstring injury, and Foley said, no, no, you can wrestle, and you will, and I will be doing commentary. And it was kind of funny, because Jarrett really did hurt his hamstring, it wasn't quite as bad as they made it out to be, but... Jeff Jarrett never wrestles on TV, and like two days after he hurts himself, he has to wrestle. Sure. Why? Well, because is this is one of the main reasons wrestling was was uh, became a work, so you could protect yourself <laughs> and work more dates and make more money. Is that the whole idea? Everything goes in cycles, Brian. This took forever to spit out, by the way. It it, it did take you about ninety seconds to summarize. It took them about twenty minutes to get through. Um, it was mostly good, particularly to the point where Mick said, I, I can't understand why you uh, would put me in this four-way instead of a one-on-one match, unless, as he noted, your favorite food is a peanut butter and jealousy sandwich, which I thought was funny. Great. Yeah. So that's the, that, that, that is the stick there. Uh, Mick Foley and Jared are being torn apart by jealousy. Wow. The beautiful people said they were going to have a celebration tonight. They also talked about, and I'm quoting here, their sweet, sweet asses. And they bounced up and down so their boobs jiggled. A+. plus. Don West interviewed Team 3D, whose boobs also jiggled, actually. D-. minus. Put over beer money for bringing out the best in them on Sunday, called them the future of tag team wrestling, and then said they were proud to be in a company that actually took tag team wrestling seriously. True. Undoubtedly True. So they were going to have a first-time-ever Team 3D Invitational where the tournament winner got a trophy, a check for $100,000, and the opportunity to wrestle for the titles. So, yes, $100,000 and a trophy. Yes. I cannot wait to see the trophy you for this, You can't just get way. your 100000 and go buy your own fucking trophy. No, you get you, you have $100,000 and a $26 trophy, too. Wow. I cannot wait to see the trophy that Brother Ray and Devon in, uh, uh, design. Beer Money and Consequences Creed... And Jay Lethal, tag team match, four-way, or a tag team match, four quarterfinals. Jesus Christ. Beer Money versus Consequences Creed and Jay Lethal in a quarterfinal match for the Team 3D Invitational Tag Team Tournament for the titles, or something. Anyway, they had a, uh, they went a long time, actually, and they had a uh, pretty good little match. And everything was great until the finish, which was a TNA moment. Which, of course, is all four guys in the ring doing spots and the ref doesn't care until it's time for the finish, at which point he suddenly cares way too much. So, Bear Money ended up hitting him with a move. The DWI got the pin and uh, they now advance. When you say a lot of time, I assume you mean by TNA standards? Uh, probably five, maybe perhaps six minutes? Jesus Christ, that's 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 how much time they have on a, on a full hour sometimes. Yeah, that, is, that is true. Uh, th- this was good, but I kept thinking if this had been twice as long, it probably would have been twice as good. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> is that how it is with almost every match in TNA? No. Sometimes it's so it's so well, short it's just pointless. The women's match actually. There, 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 there was one of those in the show too, but th- this was just long enough to make me think I want to see these men wrestle more, and then they cut it off. So that sucked. Barash interviewed Angle about Sunday. Angle was trying to talk about how they beat themselves. Nobody beat them. And then Steiner said he held himself responsible for what happened. He said Jarrett was a sorry son of a bitch. He had thrown 20 years of friendship by not joining the Mafia out the window at lockdown. He said he was going to treat him like a young punk in his match tonight. And when he was done, he was going to spit in his face. This Steiner's was, promos are awesome. This is a very good promo and a very good, in theory, a very good angle leading to a match down the road. Not but tonight. I, I realize that, but for what this segment was, it was tremendous. Not to mention the fact that we just learned last week that they've been friends for 20 years. Now it's over. <laughs> that that is some classic teenage right there. We have to have a story. <laughs> Let's do all the all the backstory this week and the conclusion next week. Of course. Then we had Borash interviewing Jarrett again, who said he did not give a fuck how Scott felt. He said the mafia didn't care about him for the last six months, and the pay per view made a business decision. Screw Scott Steiner, he said. Screw the mafia. Screw Mick Foley. And as he's talking about screwing, up walks Eric Young. Jared, the owner of the company is ranting and raving at telev- uh, television cameras. Eric Young walks up and says, Jared, I hate to interrupt you right now, but I really need a favor. What is a favor, you ask? He says, I didn't know what to do to get over. <laughs> what can I do to get ahead? 
Jarrett turns his back, he puts his head against the brick wall, he slams into the wall, like, what the fuck? He was so exasperated, and it was so awesome. No, seriously, what could I do to get over? I guess Eric was supposed to be like a valiant fighting baby face here. He was I saying wanted he to wanted... punch this fucker in the face through the TV. <laughs> he was, yes, he was. His point was that he wanted. He said he wanted a chance. He wanted a chance to earn something. But uh, yes, it, it was very poor timing on his part. <laughs> Jarrett was completely justified in blowing him off. And finally, he said, "Hey, there's a tag team tonight. The guy's partner didn't show up. You can go fight and team with Holiday." He stormed off, and Eric said, "Who's Holiday?" Of course, I was hoping it would be a. Hoping it would be a skinny guy with a pair of purple eyeglasses. It's a Batman joke. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Geeks everywhere just said, yeah. I I would bet nobody ever said yeah, actually, when they heard that one, except for the largest geeks, who actually probably were watching this show, quite frankly. So, yes. I was just going to say Raven, for example, would mark out right there. Oh, Great. Hurricane Helms, you know what I was talking about. yip de doo Al Snow. Everybody who knows anything about coolness would have known this was a Doc Holiday reference, for Christ's sake. They had a cross-the-line cam following Foley all over the place on Sunday. These ruled. Basically, he's 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 a heel, I guess. I don't know what he is, actually. He's, <laughs> I don't, I've given up trying to figure that out. He was supposed to be heelish when doing this. He was now the champion. He wanted everyone in the world to know in as, as most annoying a manner as possible. So, for example, he put his children on the bus with the belt over his shoulder, and he made sure to tell the bus driver, Hey, I just happened to win this thing yesterday. Yes. Hilarious. It was awesome. He was he was basically you, the guy you see at wrestling shows with the belt over his shoulder, except he actually was the world heavyweight champion. But he behaved the exact same way. And it was great. I will debate this with Lance on Thursday's show because I know that he he did not he was not a fan of these segments, and as a preview here, I will just say that except for like last week and the last couple of weeks, this show always sucks. This show always sucks a massive cock. So if I can at least laugh, that is a win to me. Sure, that is a victory. All we ask is to be entertained. All we ask. There were a bunch of stupid skits on the show we tonight. We're about to get to one, by at the way. At least I laughed at this one. Yes. Therefore, I consider it a victory. Yes, Nash and the Survivor chick, whose name I cannot possibly remember, were backstage with Booker and Charmel. Nash said he was going to win the Legends title back for Booker. As they were talking, out of nowhere. Charmel, who has not spoken since she was abducted by Samoa Joe weeks back, suddenly begins screaming at the other chick, who begins screaming at her. So Nash and the chick leave, and Charmel ends up telling Booker he'd better handle the situation or she would handle it. What situation? The situation? What situation is she talking about? The situation, Brian, is there is another female in the room. This is unacceptable. I was so angry watching this. <laughs> That's the best explanation I could possibly think of. You better handle the situation or I'll handle it. The Survivor Chick didn't even say anything to Charmel. No. She existed. She didn't do anything. She was just standing there being another girl. God, this was awful. <laughs> And what a fucking waste of money the Survivor Chick is. <laughs> so far, she has produced, and I guarantee you this is true, she has produced zero dollars in profit. Look at all of the cost-cutting TNA has been doing. So they could bring in this fucking Survivor Chick that has done nothing. Literally fucking nothing. More with Foley. Still he, going around town he, showing off his title. He went to the deli where he explained he was the first champion to be there in ten years. He spoke to a woman's husband on the phone, saying she was the uh, he was the first world champion this man had talked to in his four years of marriage. He was very very proud. He wanted everyone to know. They they also showed a bit here of the uh, TNA iPhone game that looks awesome. It looks like they just ported a Nintendo game from about 1986 onto a phone, and I want it. Then we went back to Jarrett again. Yes, the, the, the story here was, I, this was like the third or fourth time they tried. No, this isn't the second time they tried. But he kept, Boras kept trying to get an interview, and every time he started, Jarrett would get interrupted. And Boras would get exasperated and say, come on, Jeff, I need this answer. And TNA does this all the time. They'll have the, someone will try to get an interview, they won't be able to get it for some reason, and they will say, we need to know. And I ask again, why? 
I don't know why we need to know. Why do we need to know? What we don't need to know. Thinks about Scott they Steiner's pretend match. like we need to know. But I, I don't believe them, though. It's a bad <laughs> of course pretending. Not. Of course not. TNA, stop telling us what we need to know. We don't need to know it. AJ and Chris Daniels walked in, who now is again Chris Daniels. At least that's what AJ called him. Uh, Although this... Tanae only referred to him as Daniels. I don't know what his name is supposed to be anymore. He may not have a first name. I'm not sure yet. So they put him over, and Jared said this was why he did what he did, because of these young fellows. He said they had his back. Then we had, and I swear to God this is true, Sojourner Bolt against Taylor Wilde in a no-DQ ladder match. You know, as opposed to a ladder match with DQs, That's which one, I have yet to see in my entire time watching professional wrestling. That is one stupid thing about this. Stupid thing number two would be, maybe when they did the, the mid-show card rundown a half hour in, maybe they said, hey, we got a ladder match coming up, but I missed it. Which means they did a ladder match with no build, thus that it did not, you know... Who it. cares about no build? There was no reason for there was it. No reason for it. Why no. did you have a ladder match? I don't know. The winner of this, the winner of this wrestling match, gets a shot, and I and I quote Mike Tanay here, an eventual title he, shot. Uh, he also this could yes. be two years down the road. Sure. This person gets a title shot at Angelina Love. So for some reason they decide they have to have a fucking contract hanging above the ring that they have to get with a ladder. Mm -hmm. Okay, these two can't even have a good match, no. and then you throw a ladder in. Right. They did shit like a a suplex off the bottom rung, you know, the one that is lower than the level of the bottom rope. Right. Which, so, by the way, that still looked brutal. So I'm Sojourner fine with them not killing themselves. Got brass knuckles out of her boobs, which, she, by the way, she was hiding from the ref in this no DQ ladder match. Right. She finally hit Taylor. Taylor fell off the ladder. She got the contract. Sojourner Bolt is getting a title shot against Angelina Love. She pulled out the, wow. brass, she pulled out the brass knuckles, and she had the, the part that's supposed to go in the palm of your hand. She had it sticking out, and I thought, oh, God, she's going to kill this poor girl. And thankfully, she did not. She hit her with the side of her hand, so that worked out okay. But I believe Jim Cornette is still employed for by TNA, is he not? Yeah. That was like a week ago. Didn't he just write about how he was concerned about yes. wrestlers uh, working matches that had stupid gimmicks for no reason and yes. they were invented by writers who knew they would not be wrestling themselves? Yes. Hypocrisy? <laughs> Why is that hypocrisy? Well, I guess he works for a company that does these things. I know. He's pointing out how stupid it is. It ain't hypocrisy. He didn't fucking book it. That's true. <laughs> if he's, if he's so appalled, he could call him out by name or something, but... He was right. It's stupid. This is an example of it. Hypocrisy. Yeah, his, his, uh, it's hard to take that stand seriously when the company he works for does it, and and he. Yeah, but why is that hypocrisy? He has no choice. He could quit. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait a second. If you're writing for fishing, and, oh, you did this on this show. Remember when Fishing and Hunting News told you you had to stop writing about bass? Right. And you came on the show and you bitched about how stupid this was? Mm -hmm. Why didn't you just quit? Because, I, well, at least I called my company by name. If he had mentioned, I work for TNA Wrestling and they do stupid shit like this. Otherwise, it comes off like he's attacking the opposition. Well, I think everybody who read that knew that he was talking strictly about TNA. Well, perhaps I'm just dumb then. Hypocrisy was just a poor word. Then we had... What do we have? Jocelyn called. Oh, Christ. Jared's daughter called, and we never heard anything about it again. And, and, and this is where Borash said, I'll never get this interview. And we never did, and it was fine. Life went on. No one missed anything. Maybe he doesn't want to quit because he wants to continue getting paid. Well, that's a good reason. But <laughs> I just, it, it, it's, I mean, hypocrisy is a poor word. A better example would be the fact that just, it's stupid his company does it. His own company does not read his blog. His own company, maybe they do read his blog. They want to throw it in his face. I don't know. It just struck me as amazing that that his own company did a perfect example of what he was what he was critiquing. He probably critiqued it after this was taped. That's possible too. I'm sure that's what he did. Actually, we had the beautiful people in the ring for the biggest celebration in the history of the world. That's what they said. Yes, Angelina did a heel promo, bearing you actually, Vinny, an unemployed fan. Who had lost his home. <laughs> she, she did say, thank you all, and I said, you're welcome. Velvet said they had a surprise for her, the dancing boys. 
I have no idea where they came up with these dancing boys, but it was no place where boys actually dance. I am not from, despite what Brian may tell you, I am not terribly familiar with male strippers. I guarantee you, these are the dorkiest male strippers on earth. So Awesome Kong ran down across the party. The girls fled. She killed a dancing boy, and that was that. That was that, in fact. <laughs> that was that. I thought perhaps you'd comment on the power bomb since I didn't actually see it. It's a power bomb. She picked up a guy and killed him. One guy. Yeah, it's also awesome. he was smaller than her. She's a, a, a big girl, not terribly tall, but he he was even shorter. She power bombed him. She stared down Angelina. Angelina looked scared. They then cut to another segment of Mick Foley showing his belt to people. This time he went to his massage therapist, who was a blind woman. And uh, Mick Foley was here. There was a great spot here where, as he was getting him as his massage, he was laying on the massage table with his face on the championship belt as a pillow. Yeah. That was great. Then he uh, went to give her a tip, and he said, here's a 20, and he handed her a 1. But she said, Mick, even I know this is a 1. And he said, oh, that's right. Here you go. Here's some championship money. And he handed her a $100 bill. Wow. And she said, oh, now this is a 20. He said, well, that's five twenties, but anyway. Ha-ha! Ha-ha-ha-ha-ha! ha 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 came out with his Survivor Chick for a match. With AJ Styles. Nash moves like a 200-year-old man. He doesn't look a day over 65. He doesn't look a day over 300. His hair... His hair. I don't even know what to say about his hair. <laughs> it's, it's, always, it's been gray for a long time, but usually it's either wetted down or tied back. This time it was totally, completely dry. And every time he turned his head or fell down or anything, I expected dust to fly off. He looked like a mummy. He had this, when he came down, he had his he and uh, the survivor girl were walking arm in arm. I think it was supposed to look like he was escorting her to ringside. It looked like she was holding him up. It looked like she was walking her her great great grandfather to his casket. Yes, That's what it looked like. And he had this big fucking thing on his arm, like like when uh, Luke Skywalker had his arm chopped off, and in uh, Star Wars. Which uh, also reminded me of of the uh, Return of the Jedi when they unmasked Darth Vader. That fucking guy looked younger than Kevin Nash did here. He looked so fucking old. I then they had a horrendous match. AJ did everything he possibly could, but Nash could not even move. Yeah, I, I, I thought, considering Kevin Nash is dead, I thought this was not that bad. Wow. So, oh really? Especially the spot at the end where AJ is supposed to go for a springboard 450. And Nash moved at the speed of... He moved as fast as he possibly could because he is dead. He moved at the speed of evolution. If I take it back. And I'm not talking about the, the wrestling group. I'm talking <laughs> the, about the the scientific theory. Scientific theory of evolution. I AJ take it back. landed on him and then had to sell it. When, when I said he moved fast for a dead guy, the zombie from ECW would have gotten out of the way of this. So. AJ landed on him, had to begin selling, and uh, Nash got up. They did some shit. And then uh, I guess Booker and Charmel came out. The ref saw it and called for the DQ. Bad. Their, their method of, of, of swerving us, I guess, was the referee clearly and plainly saw this disqualification, but he did not call for it for like a minute. He let them keep going until Nash went for the power bomb, and they actually worked me. I thought he was going to win the Legends title here. Listen, there is no need for Kevin Nash to ever win a wrestling match ever again. <laughs> it accomplishes nothing. Then we had Nash and his chick yelling at Booker and his chick and Angle yelling at all of them, and I didn't care. No Limit against Trevor Murdoch and Eric Young. Trevor's new name is the Outlaw Jethro Holiday. Didn't even get new tights, by the way. No, he took a black tape and taped over where it said Murdoch on his ass. Yeah. Awesome. Match was fine. Good guys who are Americans, of course, because in TNA the foreigners are all bad guys. Ran wild. And Bashir tried to interfere, got knocked off the apron, Young got the pin. So Young and Jeff Rowe Holiday are uh, advancing here. They will, they will face beer money in the semifinals, and that'll, if they give them time, it'll be a fun match. Quarterfinals? There'd be four matches. Did they actually have brackets? They, they did. They That's right. They, are, they, are, they, they, well, they, they put are a bracket semifinal. of the four teams we've seen That's so right. far. That's so right. So the other four teams, we have no idea. Couldn't they just have... Why did they announce these two were facing each other? Shouldn't they have been in opposite brackets so we'd at least have some uh, some question about what was going to happen next? Why did they do anything? I don't I, know. I'm asking too many questions. Then we had the blonde interviewing AJ outside. Joe showed up with his Taz towel, upset that uh, 
AJ was upset that Joe never returned his calls, and Joe basically said, I don't have any friends anymore, just the nation of violence. Wow. Sucks to be him, then. Why are we supposed to care at all about Samoa Joe? I don't. Even, even I'm long past that. the point. Dr. Skit, stupid, uh, or Dr. Stevie, stupid skit with Abyss and Lauren. As, as soon as they put up the graphic, I made a conscious decision, I am done with these. All I know is, is Lauren was mad at the beginning, and she was not mad at the end, and stupid music played. And all, all I know is that as soon as I saw the graphic, I said, I'm not watching this, and I began to study my bottle of beer intently. Today did a sit-down interview with Daniels, who I guess lost his first name again, and talked about how much he loved AJ, so I presume he's turning on him soon, and said this was his chance to be smoking up in the same breath as guys like Angle, Eddie Guerrero, and Dean Malenko. So he's back. We had more Foley bullshit. Actually, this one, this one had the best one of all. Foley is citing autographs and comically running from fans and this and that. And then he gets to the airport where there's security, <laughs> the the uh, the, the uh, metal, detector? metal detector. He deliberately walks through the metal detector with his belt over his shoulder. The fucking thing goes off and he goes, oh, is it this right here? <laughs> awesome. He was great. I, I will say, and I suspect this is what Lance is going to say, they made their world champion look like kind of a tool. A clown. Because, uh, yeah, it, he's, he's a clown. He was being sworn by one fan at a time and running and making jokes about Beatlemania as he ran away from one old woman. But, uh, it was funny. It was legit funny, first of all. And, and it, it, it just, it, I don't know. It made, it was making fun of his own pretentiousness as, as much as anything. He was, he was so happy about this belt, like it made him a better human being. When, in fact, it does not make him a better human being. He's still pretty much evil. Jeff Jarrett and Scott Steiner in a Cactus Jack Smack Attack match. What they did was they put gimmicks all over the impact zone. There were cans, crutches, and a pogo stick. And they ended up outside the ring, and Scott Steiner knocked Jeff Jarrett on his ass... Then he saw the pogo stick. He hit Jarrett once with the pogo stick. And Jarrett was down and out. And so Scott Snyder decided, what the hell? I will use this pogo stick the way it was intended to be used. He then proceeded to step onto the pogo stick and begin bouncing up and down. Which, number one, was the funniest fucking visual you could possibly imagine. So he's jumping up and down on this pogo stick... And he briefly falls off. He is, however, so proud to have achieved this feat that he has to jump back on and continue bouncing up and down. So he continues bouncing up and down. Jared gets to his feet. Steiner cannot help but continue bouncing because he's having so much fun. And Jared finally clotheslined him off the pogo stick, and he took a bump. Fucking phenomenal. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. That was the highlight, but this is, usually I see hardcore matches and I think, this is stupid. I don't know why you guys put themselves through this. I watched this hardcore match and I thought, this looks like fun. Highlighted by the Pogo Stick spot. There was also the uh, the, the uh, hollow plastic Santa Claus that Steiner still swung lightly yes. at Jared. And uh, th there was barbed wire they never used. There was just, just stuff. We need to talk more about this Santa Claus. All right. It was a hollow plastic Santa Claus. that had to weigh about five pounds, maybe. If I actually took this and seriously hit, for example, Clifford over the back with this, as hard as I could, Clifford would be fine. Yes. Steiner slowly swung it at Jarrett. <laughs> Steiner hit Jarrett with a worked shot. And Jarrett flew into the guardrail. Awesome. This was awesome, yes. They, they, they had a barbed wire out there in the ring. It was merely a decoy. I don't think they even teased it. No. It was just there. They, they had all sorts of other assorted plunder, trash cans, and I thought this was a and, decent match. It was it was fine. It was, it was highlighted, of course, by the pogo stick spot. But uh, it it was a decent match, but I, I know I ran about this earlier, but again, a 20-year friendship torn apart by one man's decision to not, you know, join this or this, his, his friend's heel group. This should be a pay-per-view match, especially considering it's a hardcore match where they're beating each other with weapons. Of course not. No. Don't be ridiculous. Event. So it was fun. And uh, even uh, just Jared, by the way, did he manage to get Scott Steiner up for an electric chair. That was impressive. And so he, he finally hit the uh, stroke. He hit the guitar shot and hit the stroke for the win. Mick Foley declared, good match. 
Yeah. That didn't entertain me. So the mafia ran in and are just, just angle, I guess. And they put angle in a combination camel clutch, uh, uh, ankle lock. So Mick Foley ran in with a chair. He hit angle again with the safest chair shot you ever saw. To save Jarrett, his to, friend. To now, save apparently. his friend Jarrett, oh, sure. And, uh, Ang- Steiner turned around, saw this, fled, so he never even got hit. So, Steiner, or excuse me, Foley is walking around making sure they leave, then he turns around and he gloms Jeff in the head. Yeah. He's, he's crazy. Cause he's, I don't know what he is, but he's something. And then after that, of course, the lights went out, Bobby Lashley appeared on the ramp, and Jarrett and company, actually Jarrett was down, so I guess Foley looked shocked. No, but, Jarrett, Jarrett was, he was on one knee, leaning on a chair, cutting a promo, saying he was going to fire Foley. Oh, so, that's right. He was going to shove a pink slip up his ass. Yes. And, and so, then, then, then uh, Lashley came out. Yeah, Jarrett was concerned, and Steiner and Angle smiled. And that Which, was the end of the show. I, 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 I don't pogo know. stick, everybody. Just, just get the pogo stick spot. The pogo stick was the highlight of this program. I don't care what anybody says. Who could argue? The pogo stick was awesome. What on the show would be better than the pogo stick? I mean, seriously, how's the pogo stick spot any different from New Jack playing guitar before he glommed somebody with it? It's all the same thing. There was a pogo stick there. What yeah, the fuck the, are you going to do with the thing? The difference is Scott Steiner on a pogo stick is funnier <laughs> than New Jack with a guitar. That is true. <laughs> it's undeniably true. All I can think of, I, I was, I, I thought when I saw the pogo stick, maybe Jarrett will try that. And then Scott got it. And I thought, well, Jared's going to take this away. And as Scott started to climb on it, I thought, this pogo stick is doomed. It's going to split into, into splinters. But no, it held up. It was the strongest pogo stick on earth. It was great. So anyway, uh, thumbs down for the show. I, I was spoiled last week. I know a lot of people crossed the line. I suspect a lot of people crossed back over the line here tonight. So uh, I'm actually going to disagree. Between the Foley segments and the pogo stick and the decent wrestling... So that all should have been longer. I'm going to give this a very mild thumbs up. A mild thumbs up? Sure. Uh, the, uh, the most I could even allow you to give is a thumb in the middle. You are not. I will not allow you, you will to censor give, my opinion. I will I censor your opinion on this radio show if you give it any more than a thumbs in the middle. At least last week, not only was a good show, but when it was over, you wanted to see lockdown. This had some funny moments, but who gives a fuck about sacrifice? Well, not me. <laughs> So I could not possibly achieve more than a thumbs up. But it entertained me. Sure. That's all I ask. So did last week. No, this is more entertaining. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna make you watch that Sojo Bolt ladder match again. It went two and a half minutes, so we're gonna be heartbroken? I think it went longer than that. Let me check. I find this just appalling. TNA times for week eighty two. That ladder match was three minutes long. I was close. That's two minutes and fifty nine seconds longer than it needed to be. They should have just started at the top of the ladder, they and did. one of them just grabbed it. They actually did start at the top of the ladder. 